Welcome to Nintendo Voice Chat episode 483. I pressed the buttons backwards. I did camera oh. first and then jingle, so there's going to be like a nice Nintendo jingle there, and we're just kind of sitting and waiting. It's anyway, perfect. That's wonderful. That's how's perfect. everybody doing? I'm your host, Zachary Ryan, for this week's episode, um, and I'm joined by Jonathan Dornbush. Beyond. Casey DeFridis. Hey, get, get out. You get, brought me here. This, this is, is what NBC. I do. This is NBC. This is Nintendo Voice Chat. Chat. And Janet Thank Garcia. You. Hey. Hey, what's up? Um, so, yeah, Casey's not hosting this week because she spent many, many hours and days and nights uh, playing Pokemon Sword and Shield, which, as I'm sure you've guessed by now, uh, <laughs> we're going to spend a lot of this episode talking about, which is what you've been requesting for weeks. So I'm really excited to just dive, <laughs> sorry. dive right into this big boy topic. But here's the deal. Um, Pokemon Sword and Shield is by far and away the biggest release that Nintendo's got going for it this fall. Um, and we will be talking about the good and the bad and yep. all the in between this episode. But first I want to ask, um, wh what's new? How's everybody doing? How are you guys feeling about um, quarter four? We're getting oh, into real gosh. holiday crunch time. Uh, uh, the results are great. I love the margins of Q4. It's going I, very well. Mm. I'd like it's more sleep to be in our margins, going. please. I just need to make it to Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gosh, like mm -hmm. the week before Thanksgiving. Yes. So, what, um, uh, just out of okay. curiosity, what is everybody's favorite Thanksgiving food? I don't have one. Do you like them all equally? No, I just, I never grew up with like particularly great Thanksgiving dinners. Okay. So I've never like glommed onto a specific food because it was more about just getting through the dinner. Got mm. it. So no. always count on Dornbush bringing us down. What about Any you, time. Casey? What do you got? Uh, turnips. Turnips? <laughs> That's a Florida what thing for sure. Look, I really like, animal okay. crossing thing. I like mashed turnips. They're delicious. Ugh. And once I realized I could cook them myself during not Thanksgiving, I got really happy about it. They're a great healthy alternative to potatoes, and you can use them in a lot of different ways. And I like I like turnips. My, my favorite Thanksgiving food is potatoes because they taste better than turnips. But turnips are better for you than potatoes. So. Thanksgiving is not a time for health. It's no, a time I mean, no, for gluttony. Not. Yeah. I'm, I'm like... I like stuffing the best, and yeah, that's stuff literally oh, stuffing is real good. That's literally just butter and bread with yeah. sausage, and yeah, so it's very good. But if um, you use turnips instead of bread and butter, it's then a delicious. It's a question for you: turnips. Are you trying to say that potatoes are bad for you? They have more calories in them than turnips. Hmm. Anyway. anyway. <laughs> Moving right along, uh, yeah, the topic for this week is definitely Pokemon Sword and Shield. Um, this is the eighth generation of yes. Pokemon. Thank you. You did it. You Thank got you. It. Uh, Casey, you reviewed the game and you gave it a whopping 9.3 for amazing. Um, so I kind of wanted to start by um, kind of outlining Casey has, has done the review. Janet's been working on the mm -hmm. guide. Jonathan loves Pokemon is and true. is very excited mm -hmm. and has followed the game up to release and is really looking forward to playing it. And I am here because somebody needed to host the show. Thank you, um, Zach. Yeah, so... Uh, without further ado, let's dive right in. Um, first of all, what what do you want to say just sort of from the outset about the game? Like, what do people, the uninitiated, need to know about <laughs> Pokemon Sword and Shield? Okay. I'm okay. going to give a very brief uh, review. I have more, my review is more than 4,000 words long. Mm -hmm. The video review is about 1,300 words long. I've said a lot about this game, and there is still room for me to say more about this game, but I figured I should stop writing at some point. But overall, there are a few very small minor problems with the game that don't affect your overall or at least mine and Janet's overall enjoyment of it. Overall it's a great really fun joy to play. I think the change in random encounters is the biggest factor into why I love this game so much. Mm -hmm. I that change just I'm getting really thrown off by the echo in the back. <laughs> I'll go. I'll go try to mute that. Maybe. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, now I'm thrown off my thought. Okay. Random encounters. Yeah. No, my thought. My thought on this. I think that's why I gave it such a high score is because of that one change, but also because the amount of Pokemon is really substantially front loaded in the first couple of hours of the game. You reach the wild area in the first two hours, and then every day. The Pokemon in these micro areas, which are immediately opened up for you, change. And if you run into a Pokemon in the, into the grass, you can catch it. Mm. There are going to be some Pokemon in between the grass or above the grass that might be too strong for you until you get enough gym battle, um, enough gym badges. But otherwise, you can catch them. So by the time I got to the first gym, I had like twenty five Pokemon to choose from, which usually doesn't happen. And I was yeah. actually excited about all of my choices, and I had a hard time 
choosing just six to take with me. Sure. Um, there's so much, you really just, I think, what do you guys want to know? There's so yeah, much. I could so go on for literally I, so I, long. Well, I went through and kind of picked out some of the, uh, the, the points that I thought really struck me from your review. Um, and also just some of the questions that I had about the game. Um, ultimately, you know, I've kind of been talking about how I'm probably going to pass on this, this game because not because of any of the controversy or anything, but just because like, I'm not super interested in another 40 to 50 hour game mm -hmm. before the end of the year. <laughs> totally um, understandable. Yeah. I, I think that like, I, this might be a game that I go back to in, in a lull, but in the grand scheme of things, like I kind of want to focus on other stuff. Um, and I've always been a very casual Pokemon fan. Um, so I urge you to convince me okay. that this is a game that I should play. And uh, I will start by talking about uh, the first thing that struck me that is like supremely interesting. One of my biggest turnoffs of like not just Pokemon, but a lot of Nintendo games in general is uh, the fact that there's less hand holding in the way that they're handling like tutorials in the game. So can you guys start off by talking a little bit about that, that aspect of it? That this is honestly kind of incredible and it's kind of dynamic in the way it handles tutorials. So sometimes when you get to a point in the game, for example, you get to the professor and she asks, oh, you know all about Pokemon, right? And they let you answer yes or no, basically. And if you say yes, she's like, okay, cool. And then that's it. Which like, is that's super amazing. rare because a lot of times in games, that answer doesn't matter. Like yeah. in games that aren't choice driven, oftentimes when the player is given a choice, it doesn't change very much what the NPC responds with. They still give you the same information, but all that's kind of wiped away in this Pokemon game, which is great because if you want to know that information, you can click into it and just answer honestly. But if you don't, then you don't. And like one of my favorite things that I even remarked on uh, back when I previewed the game before Casey did the review is that you can catch a Pokemon before being taught how to catch a Pokemon, which has never happened in a Pokemon game before. So there's no longer the whole, oh, let's show you how to catch Pokemon. Then they cut to someone doing it, explaining all the steps. And for people that have played, not even all, necessarily all the Pokemon games, but pretty much any of them, it's always like, okay, here we go. It's the same thing. Like everyone already knows it. So having that from the get-go really made me feel like, oh, this is gonna be a, a little bit of a new take on the formula that's been established. And so is it, does it react dynamically? Like if you go out and, and catch a Pokemon before the Pokemon tutorial session, do they just like sort of omit that portion? Do they react to the way like, oh, I see you've already caught a Pokemon. Like we don't need to spend the time doing this. That's yes, exactly that what that's it does. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the characters will still be in there in the route waiting for you, but then comment. And then just yeah. let you go on your way without showing the catching Pokemon catching cutscene that they usually show. Yeah. But you still get all the like I guess story set up in the yeah. Region and he, he still gives yeah. you twenty free Pokeballs. Oh, good. but it's just okay. like oh, oh, you're so rich in this game. I yeah. love how rich you are. Like you start <laughs> off with like plenty of money, plenty of Pokeballs, and it feels like they kind of just let you immediately get into the adventure in a way that doesn't always happen in RPGs uh, or even in Pokemon games, just like in general. So I really appreciate that aspect of it. Yeah, I mean, you get, like I mentioned, you get to the wild area within the first two hours. And then when you get there, they don't, it doesn't limit you. It's like, here's the wild area. And yeah. it doesn't, like the only thing that made me continue on to the next town is that my, I needed to start healing my Pokemon. And I didn't realize at the time that camping heals and revives your Pokemon. And I can do it from literally anywhere. <laughs> so that was cool. I could have stayed in there forever, but you know, maybe I, I shouldn't. Right. And also I had a deadline, so I had to keep going. But Fair <laughs> enough. Uh, yeah. You came over to talk to me a little bit about some of the stuff that you were learning in the course of your playing and, and the description of like, yeah, they don't, they really stream on the tutorial. If you elect not to, you know, opt mm -hmm. into that, like that's something that I've been looking for in games like Zelda and, uh, uh, other Nintendo franchises forever. Like I would love so much if the next Zelda game, you know, you ran into somebody and they're like, oh, have you gone on an adventure like this before? And if you just said yes, then you could just skip all the mm -hmm. tutorial stuff and like not have to deal with all the pop-ups and stuff. Like that would be amazing. So I, I like that that this game is doing something in terms of tutorial. And like, I know I've talked about Dragon Quest XI forever, but um, Dragon Quest XI does this amazing thing where every time you boot back into the game, it gives you a plot synopsis of what's happened over the course of like the, your time with the game. So like those two in tandem is the ideal situation for me because like I end up taking so many breaks from games and mm -hmm. coming back to them, you know, weeks later because of the nature of our job. Like it, that, it would be incredible. That's one thing I completely forgot to mention in the review. When you bring up your menu in the top left corner, corner it tells you what you need to do next. Uh -huh. And That's it's wonderful. always there in your top mm -hmm. left. And also in the bottom of the screen in the menu, it's always telling you things that are interesting. Like there's a blizzard somewhere in the wild area or you can go pick up your Pokemon from their jobs. 
<laughs> yeah. how, how much of a factor is the wild area from what you both played? Now, because don't get ahead of me, Jonathan. Oh, well, God. Yeah, they brought it up several times. I, was I, using I would say it depends on what you want. Like yes. It plays into the yeah. game as much as you want it to. Similar to Casey because of what we were doing and the fact that it benefits us to get through as much of the game as quickly as possible in order to give that information to you guys, either in the form of a review or in a wiki guide. Uh, I would have spent way more time in the wild area if I was just playing as a fan for fun. So before we get too deep, mm -hmm. what is the wild area and why do we want to talk about it? The wild area is one of the biggest components of this game that is new to this game. And it's one of the main things that Game Freak discussed in the promotion of this game. It was probably, in, in my opinion, the driving promotional angle on mm -hmm. the game. So the wild area is a somewhat open, like open-ish. I would describe it as open world inspired, but not open world in the sense that it it's not like completely endless. And as Casey mentioned, it has these small subsections uh, that are all labeled on your map and there'll be different weather in those different subsections. And it's basically a, a fairly large um, kind of foresty slash some areas are sandy and there's like some lakes, um, big nature like it's like a wildlife Space? reserve. Yeah, it's like a wildlife yeah. reserve. I think yeah. it's great. It's exactly. It. Yeah. And yeah. it's enclosed by like large cliffs and the weather, when the weather changes, the Pokemon that inhabit those micro regions also change. And there are dens and those dens that you interact with uh, trigger max raid battles, which are when you fight a Gigantamax Pokemon. If you can't, you know, catch that Gigantamax Pokemon, it might have like better stats and, you know, just things like that. So it just depends on if you want to use that as a way to catch different Pokemon without having to just wait to get through the entire game to see what's out there. It's a way to catch higher level Pokemon because as Casey mentioned, some of them will be a bit above your level. So sometimes like what I would do is I'm like, I'm just going to pour my whole energy and my team mm -hmm. into trying to get this like level 16 Pokemon, even though I'm only like level nine or 12. Um, once again, max raid battles are huge. Uh, if you camp there uh, via local and online play, people can like join and check out your campsite. Um, and then there's like items always responding in there. There's basically a lot of reasons to go back if you're looking to get a bunch of Pokemon and just kind of max out the amount of items and things you can do in the game. Uh, and a little bit of that is not opened up as the story progresses, but like, for instance, you don't have the the water bike, the feature on your Rotom bike right away. So you can't explore the entire thing from the start of the game, but you can explore a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Oh. Cool. Um, so one of the things that you've highlighted both here and in your review, like from the jump, is that the elimination of random encounters completely changes the way that you play this game. And uh, to me, I can't think of an RPG that wouldn't benefit from the elimination of random encounters. <laughs> but specifically in terms of Pokemon, like the number of times that I've played a Pokemon game and been like so annoyed or frustrating, what frustrated when I've run into the 30th Ratatat or something where it's like, all right, I don't want to fight this guy and I don't want to catch him, so this is just a waste of time. So, like, is yeah. this, that's the experience that you had. Exactly. Yeah. You, there are random encounters. I, I almost got salty about this in my review because when Miranda and I talked about this really early this year, we mentioned that there are optional random encounters in which an exclamation point appears in the grass and you can choose to approach it or not. That's the way it works. It's, it's, it's optional. You don't have to, it doesn't just spring up and throw you into a battle. You see the exclamation point and then you can choose to run into it or just turn around and leave. Um, and there is still a benefit to doing these because some of those Pokemon can be more rare Pokemon or Pokemon that don't appear in the overworld. So it also includes extra variety as well. Mm. Um, but you can run through an entire cave without running into a Pokemon and that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't feel like you're under leveled or underpowered by avoiding those like just no because into. but i think a big reason from for that is because i kept going back to the wild area in between every gym badge just to see what else was there and gotcha. to do the max raid battles that would spawn every day even though that doesn't give you experience points it does reward you with experience candy mm -hmm. which unlike a rare candy which gives you a level it gives you a certain amount of experience points and there were some points where i caught pokemon that were severely under leveled compared to my actual team, but I was able to immediately get them up to speed with the candy and experiment with my team. And that's something I wouldn't have had time to do or wouldn't have wanted to really do in a normal playthrough in a past Pokemon game. Because, you know, grinding up a Pokemon from level 25 to like 40 is it's a lot. A lot. Especially when it's all <laughs> random encounters. So. Yep. <laughs> so that was really cool to not have to do that yeah. and to be able to be as flexible as I wanted to with my team. Um, you mentioned uh, the 
bike mm-hmm. or the the, the bike with the, bike. the roton bike. bike yeah uh so a lot there's a lot more traversal options in this game that i've seen from the reviews and the preview content um and then you mentioned specifically like the fast travel system is like really streamlined in your review can you talk about like how both of those change the game mm-hmm. so in for example in sudden moon you would call upon charizard which is awesome charizard's one of my favorite pokemon i thought this was like one of the coolest things when i played sun and moon and then by the time i was in the end game, I got really, really annoyed seeing that animation of that Charizard every single time I wanted to fly somewhere, especially when I'm working on wikis and I have to travel to a lot of different places really quickly, <laughs> one after the other. Mm. And in this game, you bring up your map and you pick a point to fly to, and then it just throws up like a two second loading screen of a little Corviknight, Lorvenite, uh, Lorvenite, <laughs> Corviknight loading symbol in the bottom right of it, like flying, a little you know? Corviknight Lorvenite. Yeah, you know exactly what I mean. <laughs> you know the and one. that's that's it. There's no fanfare. There's no extra animation, and like it's just very quick and convenient. And it's made even more so convenient because there are now fast travel points in the middle of routes. There are multiple Ooh. Pokemon centers in every town, and you can also fast travel to a few different points in the wild area as well. So just super convenient to be like, you know what? I don't think I fought every travel, every trainer on this route. I'm going to go back. Or like, maybe I missed an item here and et cetera. Or like if you want to go back to the stores. So that's yeah. what I mainly used it for, just quickly going back to stores. Sure. Yeah. I, d- I did want to really talk about the stores. Dude, stores are and, real good. And clothing. The clothing, the style, everything. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. So this is why you need the money. Yeah, <laughs> usually yeah, usually at IGN, I feel like, uh, you know, when somebody's working on a review or somebody's working on a guide, we have a tendency to, you know, somebody will be playing it in the office. Like when, when Janet was working on the, mm-hmm. the Luigi's Mansion guide, I would often just stop by her desk and like watch her play like a little bit of a level. And so like I hadn't had an opportunity to really see this game in motion. So this morning when I watched Casey's review, I was like overjoyed at how much the character looked like Casey running around <laughs> with the little glasses and the little ponytail. It was like perfect. Yeah. I thought that was like really spoke to a lot of the customization yeah. options. Cause I was like, wow, that just it's looks so like good. Casey. How expensive is it? In it's, the game? it's very expensive. Like my only, um, qualm, I guess, is that I wish there were even more stores cause I just cannot get enough clothing. Uh, <laughs> but there are like probably at least three clothing stores, maybe more. Four? I think there are more. I didn't keep yeah, track I'm not, of all not, of them. I'm not sure offhand. There's not one in absolutely every town, but there is like Quite several. Um, and they all have like different, options or kind of specialties like some will have really cool outerwear but they won't have like t-shirts and then the other one has t-shirts but no outerwear wear so there's like a little bit of variety in that aspect but there's what I like most about the clothes is that they look like regular clothes you would wear in real life so many times video game clothes especially Pokemon clothes are like would you like a a a shirt with like a Lapras on it and sometimes but I don't only wear Lapras shirts um, or shirts with Pokemon on them so I like and they have that too if you do want that if that's your style in those games but they also have clothes that I would just normally wear like by the end of the game my avatar looked exactly like me it had on the leather jacket like those shirts I always wear like the little boots like it looked exactly like me um and then I'm like I should probably experiment with more clothing styles in real life because it shouldn't be this easy to make myself but I really love that aspect of it um it gave me reason to want to get money and make strategies to get more money and all of them are fairly reasonably priced but some of the nice things are super expensive yeah, you know how like a For real no reason a real leather purse in real life would be really expensive yes i am aware it's just as expensive in the pokemon game good so it, it's a real economy. Those that's, leather just pants. Art, that's just art imitating life are so and expensive then, yeah but yeah, so or maybe like, they but can like do the bl- DLC like the black costumes. boots for some reason are like thousands and thousands of dollars more than the brown boots because they know I don't want those brown boots. <laughs> I don't know how they knew, but they did. So, um, and that kind of brings brings us to like one thing I really liked about the game as well is it has a lot of different systems in place that aren't just about really having a strong understanding of Pokemon lore. So, and like, with, there's plenty of ways to dig into Pokemon if you want to do breeding, if you want to do EV training, if you want it. There's like lots of different things you can do. But I like that Sword and Shield builds that in in a way that's a little bit more like simplistic but very satisfying. Like I like that I can send my Pokemon on jobs. I like that I can just experiment with trying to find more curry recipes. Like I like that there are those options that don't feel as overwhelming as the more granular stuff that longtime fans definitely have done and can still do uh, to you know certain varying degrees. But um, that's just kind of automatically built in for people that aren't going to go out of their way to do that research or aren't interested in those things like inherently. Right on. And Wulu uh, gave me six hundred dollars from a job. Like he came back and he was like, "I also have six hundred dollars." I was like, "Good job, Wulu." And Wulu. that translates to like six dollars in real life. But yeah. you know, yeah. it's, it's fine. Wulu do. It was more money than I made on my own. So <laughs> I was like, "All right." 
exactly. Uh, we kind of started this topic um, talking about fast travel and stuff, and one of the things that that bums me out, and like a game, you and I are both playing The Outer Worlds, which is a fantastic game, but you're going through these areas, and like every time you go into the new area, there's like a crazy long load screen. Um, you mentioned in your review that there's like hardly any load times at all. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Yeah, there's not. Is there a Can really you? long load in when you first start, like when you boot into the game and then... I wouldn't say so. Yeah. Well, I often admittedly didn't close the software very sure, often sure. because it's just easier on Switch. Um, the load screen for fast travel, I would say, is like two to maximum four Mississippis, more like two to three Mississippis. That's I counted crazy. it just so that you would people would know. Yeah. Um, it's not long enough. It's as, not very long. As Janet eloquently put it, you, it's not long enough for you to like pick up your phone exactly. and like mess around on your phone it is not uh -huh. long enough to check like twitter or any social right. media um, outer world lets me like make food yeah when I, yeah no yeah. when yeah. i was yeah. playing assassin's creed odyssey i was like dragalia loss had just come out so uh, i was like all right time to get through a whole level yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. yeah no pokemon is just super quick and and pretty seamless between areas and fast traveling how um how is that overworld in general because like i've seen bits and pieces of it in mm -hmm. the trailer and obviously in your review but like the way it's adapting britishism to Boy. a certain extent <laughs> Oi, as they're well known for, hey Joe Scrubbles. Um, but just like that whole aesthetic, how is it captured both in like the overworld and then in individual cities? It's very much there, mate. Like yeah. a lot of like, <laughs> like that. It's like love. Good, good, good job, mate. Like there's we'll a, see you at the whatever. We have to make up the voices in my head because there's no voice acting. Uh, sure. There's so, a restaurant you know. I'm not allowed to talk about yet. Gosh. Okay. Ugh. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's cool. We'll revisit. It's a weird, okay. weird name I, restaurant. I would say it's pretty like it feels like well fleshed out, which I think Pokemon games have always been good at like when they have a specific area or region that they're kind of pulling inspiration from. I think they do a good job at exec executing on that theme. And I feel like Sword and Shield is no different in terms of that. It does a good job good. at filling the background while you're traveling mm -hmm. with things that you may be that you may be able to visit and sometimes mm -hmm. may not be able to just to make it feel more full and lived in. But at the same time, I feel like some of the routes and areas aren't as expansive as some old Pokemon game. Like you're not gonna accidentally go off on a tangent that takes you super far off the route. It's, mm -hmm. It is a little bit more linear. Okay. But I think part of that reason is because the wild area has such play replayability that encourages yeah. you to go back to that area instead. And that also keeps any one section of the game from being getting from us getting bored from seeing the same Pokemon for so long. Mm -hmm. Like you're not gonna like be on the same route for like an hour or more seeing the same five Pokemon over and over again because you decided to explore. Yeah, that's a really good point. It was, I was surprised at how quickly it was to get from like wherever I was to the next town. Um, and when I was first playing the game, I thought like, oh, this is going to be, I didn't, I never thought it was going to be super short. Like some people were like, oh, it's super short. And I'm like, and it, it's you didn't, yeah, it's not. But when I first, <laughs> when I was first playing it, I was like, oh, maybe this won't be like, you know, like I put 50 hours into um, Sun and Moon. I'm like, maybe this won't take me quite as long. It ended up taking me like 46. So um, I'd say like towards the end, it kind of, it did slow down a bit for me, like as I got towards like the ending bits. Um, so I think people will also like feel that experience where it seems like it's faster, but then it's holistically not that much faster than uh, the previous games. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of the, um, a lot of the time cut from playing this game is done so because you're not being stopped every five seconds mm -hmm. by <laughs> random encounters. But I think in future games, I'd like to see more explorable routes in the world and not just the wild area, mm. just to kind of make exploring the rest of the world more rewarding to go back to later. Um, but from what I played, I had a great time anyway. Yeah. And I think it was plenty time, plenty long. Um, I know some some people are, are quoting like 15 or 16 hours to beat. And yeah, I, I was know. wondering where that came from because people are saying it like, oh, it's, it's... Or some speed runs. Like, yeah. Like some crazy, crazy impressive speed runs, assuming those Who's are Who's not here speed running this game though? It's not exactly. out yet. That's, yeah. It, yeah, Me and Moto. so many things. <laughs> and I know Anyone I know could. some people yeah. try and get through these games as fast as possible for coverage reasons, like if you're writing guides or trying to fill out like the Pokedex or whatever. Um, but most normal people who are playing this game for fun will probably beat it between 30 and 45 hours, maybe even longer. Like I know if I was playing it just for pleasure and had no work obligations and could spend as much time as I wanted to throughout the game, I probably would have taken... 50 to 55 hours because I like to spend time finding Pokemon with the correct nature before putting them on my team and I like making sure that I have caught every Pokemon on every route before I move on to the next one and that takes 
kind of a lot of time. Yeah. Right. Um, but I didn't do that this time. I kind of just like, well, you're a Galarian ponytail. You have the wrong nature, but that's okay. You're, we're best friends now. And then I continued <laughs> along my, my journey and it was fine. Um, but it, it took me about, about 39, 39 hours to get to the story cutscene, like uh, the story credits rather. Cool. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't know if you guys have heard, but there's a bit of controversy surrounding just a, tiny bit. just a little bit of controversy around this game. And I did, I do think as an outlet, we would be remiss if we didn't talk a little mm -hmm. bit about the, the controversy and take sort of the good and the bad into account. So, um, first of all, let's sort of, if you guys can give me a kind of an outline of what this whole Pokedex controversy is and, and why it's such a big deal to Pokemon fans. So back at E3, um, during... Uh, Treehouse, uh, Junichi Masada said that, oh, we're not going to have the full national decks in Pokemon Sword and Shield. And that was very alarming. And I was one of those people who also found it alarming. I actually went and immediately recorded a video for IGN Now about, man, you're not going to be able to have every Pokemon in this game. <laughs> That's really weird. I'm not going to be able to have my shiny Absol I've been taking with me from my um, Pokemon Pearl game. It's a real Pokemon. <laughs> Yeah, it's a shiny, shiny KCD, shiny Pokemon. And you get like a one in 8,000 chance of getting, anyway. Um, you take that Pokemon all the way. Yeah, yeah I get you, it. Can't <laughs> it's okay. you can't. You okay. can't. Um, so there were some leaks, and it turns out there will be maybe like a little less than half of all of the total Pokemon in the Galar region. So if a Pokemon is not natively found in Pokemon Sword and Shield, it will not be able to be transferred into Pokemon Sword and Shield. Um, this is the first time a Pokemon game has ever done that, and people are really mad that they won't be able to transfer their old Pokemon to this game. Um, after kind of thinking about it for a long time, and after actually playing the game, I realized a couple of things. The main thing being that in all of the past games, you weren't able to transfer your old Pokemon to it until after you beat it anyway. And this is either because of story limitations or like in Diamond and Pearl, you had to see the entire regional decks before you had access to the transfer capability or in Pokemon Sun and Moon and X and Y where you just had to wait for Pokemon Bank to work with it. Either way, I was done with the game and the story before I was able to transfer my old Pokemon there. Right. And that made me like be more okay with it because it's like, oh, this wouldn't actually affect my first playthrough of it anyway. Sure. <laughs> So um, the only thing it really affects is the end game because usually what I would do, I'd finish the game and then transfer my old Pokemon that were already trained and ready to go to then go on and challenge whatever the post game has to offer. And I can't do that in this one. But that just means that it's encouraging me to make a whole new team with new Pokemon. So I'm kind of like thinking of it as like the Ash angle <laughs> where he always leaves all of his Pokemon behind and starts over again. So. Yeah. So not a deal breaker for you. Not a deal breaker, which right. is what I say in my review. It's still upsetting, and I wish that they they did it, and I wish they would add DLC later to just kind of like add them in in patches. Have they definitively said whether or not it they will said come they're in the not future? going to? Okay. And um, I also kind of see this in the, on the competitive side, like maybe they're doing it for balance reasons, mm -hmm. even though the first year of competitive never allows old Pokemon to be used anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, but that was kind of, and I know you're getting to this point, so I'll kind of let you take it from here, Zach, but that was kind of the beginning of, like, Pokemon becoming, like, a really, like, if we want to use the toxic phrase, controversial. Yeah, I think just, like, <laughs> yeah, like, a, a toxic cesspool, for lack of a less accurate term. Um, but, like, that kind of just started where the negativity from the community like came from, and then it kind of has evolved from there. Yeah, I think, ultimately, I said this last week on the show, too, or, like, two weeks ago, but, like, Every Pokemon is somebody's favorite, right? Mm -hmm. Like even the worst, like crummiest Pokemon out there is somebody's favorite. Somebody loves them. So like I totally get that people would be disappointed that the entire Pokedex was not included in the game. Um, but I think it's interesting that it that this game has kind of made a believer of you in the fact that like you were originally like this sucks that this isn't happening but now that you've played the game you feel like okay this is cool because it encourages me to play this game in a way that I wouldn't have played previous games mm -hmm. so that's good um, but then also sort of from the fallout of that controversy is this idea that like animations are being recycled and that means that there should be more Pokemon included and that the graphics are bad and so why wasn't it on the 3DS and like there's all this other stuff wrapped up in it and uh, I just wonder like this sort of backlash, do you think it's just a snowball effect or are these qualms, having played it, something that you also identify as like, oh yeah, that could have been better? Or like, I, 
I do really think a lot of it was snowball effects. Uh-huh. Honestly, there are things in the game that could be better, but you can say that about, I think, every game. Right. Except for Tetris. Except for, t- except except for Tetris. Tetris. But I think so every good. game you're going to play and you're going to say, you know what, that could have been better. Or like, I would have liked this to be better. And there are some flaws in the game that ultimately didn't affect my experience. And yeah. I feel like the way they're being presented online are either are largely out of context or so mm. rare that I didn't even notice it until someone pointed out pointed it out. And... I had beaten the game by that point. I made sure to kind of like stay away from all of the leaks and all of the controversies and all of the complaints until after I was done the game and after I had written my first draft. Right. And it got to the point where like I read this Reddit thread and I was texting Jen and I was like, am I being gaslit? Like, what is, am I crazy? <laughs> like, I, just, I didn't Spoilers. experience. No. Yeah. And I was like, I didn't experience any of these things that these people are complaining yeah. about. I would say a lot of like, I haven't seen too many of like the intensive, like weirdly in-depth threads on information that was like stolen and leaked and cropped and re-uploaded and like made fuzzy and put on like Imgur and just all this like random stuff. Um, but I have seen a little bit of it and a few things are like have some level of validity, but a mm-hmm. lot of things don't. And having those all mixed in together and having people say, I'm going to base my opinion on Pokemon Sword and Shield based on this random Reddit thread, I think is just like a terrible decision to make. Regardless, this I would say that for any game. I would even go as far as to say like, I definitely consume reviews and I like checking out reviews sometimes before or after a game. But in general, like it's fine if it might shift your opinion slightly or give you maybe a different feeling before going into the game because I think that's natural we all like that's why we do previews right we see things and we say oh you know what I'm looking forward to it but like this thing gives me concern or now that I've seen this I'm not so sure but for people to make such a definitive claim when they haven't played the game I think it's just an ignorant thing to do and it's you you just blindly following someone's opinion and I don't think you should do that in any context but especially when it's just random like clips and pieces that you don't really know how legitimate they are or not like me and Casey looking at those things can point out oh, this seems like this part is kind of accurate or I experienced this, but I didn't experience this other thing. So like without having, being able to parse that information, you're literally just believing some random thing someone tells you. And I don't think that's ever a good idea to do in life, uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, all, which also applies to video games. So yeah, uh, the TLDR of that is don't just blindly believe things because that's how terrible things happen in the world. Um, but to their point, I think there are some like animation issues in, in certain capacities, and we can talk briefly about yeah. that next, what me and Casey think Pokemon Sword, of, Sword and Shield could have done better and what we'd want to see from future games. But yeah, holistically, it's just been like a random cesspool of misinformation. And I think just play the game if you want to play the game. If like for some reason you've seen this and have decided that because of this you're not playing the game, that's on you. But to kind of propagate it as if, hey, I have like this inside scoop of information when you like most certainly do not is just it's just ignorant i don't have another i word think for it. yeah i think the thing that made me the most annoyed was showing they showed a clip of an encounter where there was no music and if you actually play the game you'll see there is no music on purpose for dramatic effect and it kicks in during the encounter and it it makes sense in the moment to the point where like i didn't even notice it and it wasn't jarring to me at all until i had watched the clip and i was like oh there was no music during this part because it wasn't <laughs> jarring to me in the moment just like and dark souls I don't, and there yeah. were some some other really it. small things that I didn't notice at all um, that I don't I don't think are worth me- mentioning. And one of the biggest criticisms I'm getting about my review is like, oh, you didn't talk about any of the problems that the glaring problems that make this game broken. And it's like I didn't talk about any glaring problems because there aren't any glaring problems. Right. So I think like, it's, it's a, I think it's a thing yeah, of like, like it's when not you're your job to address conspiracy theories online in a review like it's supposed to be your opinion your critical analysis of the text that you played that shouldn't have anything to do with what some random person data mined and took from that that's not related to the game i'm sorry i'm gonna gonna cut you off because i just want to say like i think taken out of context like these things seem like bigger issues and when you take them in the context of the greater whole maybe Mm -hmm. it makes those those issues those those trappings a little less uh big picture and so like i think that 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 is is essentially what we're trying to say here is like you know maybe take our review as like a suggestion or or yes. something along those lines like if you want to play it like play it and enjoy it if you don't want to play it like make sure you don't want to play it for the right reasons and yeah. it's not that you're getting caught up in the conversation of like this game is bad because of xyz when those things might actually be like pretty minor in the grand scheme yeah. of things and that's so basically to sum it up it 
works perfectly fine. There are no game breaking bugs. There's nothing that doesn't work. There's no frame rate slowdown like there was in 3DS games. There are some really, really minor graphical glitches that I'm hard pressed to even call a glitch because they might be purposeful to save the for hardware problems because you know this there's like there's even pop in in like fire emblem there's crazy like, pop in in breath of the wild yeah, yeah like it's just a thing that they have to do to be on the switch and that's something that pokemon has to deal with and it's something that never negatively impacts the gameplay or slowed it down or maybe have to like quit or frustrated me and some of the things being pointed out i didn't notice at all until they were pointed out to me sure um so if really small graphical glitches and imperfect uh, technical animations make you really mad, then maybe don't play Sword and Shield. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's but, a, like I, I, I saw that complaint a lot about Breath of the Wild 2, where it was like, here's this game that to me was like sort of genre-defining and, and kind of like reinvigorating the open world uh, uh, genre and doing things that I'd never seen done in a game and, and like... Sometimes people can be reductive, and and I saw a lot about like, well, the gra the pop in is really bad, the textures are really bad. It's like, well, okay, take that out of the mix and look at the greater picture of things. And like, yes, this is an amazing masterpiece of a game that has like whatever decent textures. Like, mm -hmm. um, we're we're getting a little pedantic, so I I do want to move to a question block, yeah. uh, because I asked specifically for our audience to ask us questions for okay. question block about okay. uh, Pokemon uh, Sword and uh, Shield. So just like real quick, I just wanted to say like waking up this, I was so nervous putting out a positive review because I know how angry the community was. Sure. And I'm very glad that I still didn't change my review to reflect that. Like I would never do that. And it's one of those things where I'm like, hey, Janet, and to everyone else who played in the office, I was like, I'm not like I'm. I got assurance from other people that it is, yes, an this amazing is, Your game. score is the right way like, yeah. to and go. And yeah. I'm not saying it's not like the definitive right way, but if you really love Pokemon and the idea of Pokemon in the overworld has always excited you more than anything else and Pokemon like makes you happy, Pokemon Sword and Shield will probably make you happy too. There's yeah. nothing glaringly wrong with the game at all and it was really, really fun to play and I felt like it was a balanced overall good experience yeah. uh can't fun. imagine spending that much time <laughs> with uh my sweet sweet grookey boy and not being happy about it um okay question block jo uh john dre 510 on twitter asks uh, he says hey casey can't wait for the game after completing the main story do you feel like you need to go back and catch every pokemon coming from the red and blue era i remember the feeling of wanting to catch all 150 uh so do you feel like you were compelled to go back through and finish the game or catch all the Pokemon in the I game? I want to catch all the new Pokemon. I think there's too many Pokemon to want to go and catch them all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's hard. I want to go catch certain Pokemon and mm -hmm. the new Pokemon. Mm -hmm. and maybe not all of them. Okay. I, I could go either way. I'd say that I'd catch a, little, a few of them. Like, gotta catch a few. Gotta catch some of them, as, perhaps. As the saying goes. <laughs> because of guides, I will probably try to catch as many as humanly possible. I specifically do want to go and do a lot of max raid battles because I think they're fun and interesting, and I want to get the Gigantamax Pokemon, which you can only get in max raid battles. Okay. Uh, okay, Cool Dude Redux on Twitter says, People have been upset that Games, uh, Game Freak plays it safe with past Pokemon. Uh, people are now upset that Game Freak made changes with Sword and Shield. Are the concerns people have with Sword and Shield valid? Like the incomplete... Ah, we kind of talked about this. Yeah. Let's skip that one. Okay. Uh, Dfran on Twitter asks, Do the towns feel similar to past games in terms of size, population, and the uh, amount of enterable buildings? I think it depends on which game you're comparing it to. Like, if you look at Sun and Moon, I think it's com the towns are pretty comparable to yeah. the ex explorability of Sun and Moon. But if you look at something like X and Y, the cities in X and Y were definitely a highlight and were bigger with more things to do there than here. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize you can go up the elevator in every hotel and explore the rooms mm -hmm. until, like, very late in the game. So there's a tip for you. You can go to hotel rooms by using the elevator. Who would have known? What's going on in there? <laughs> oh, man, you have no idea. Oh, boy. Oh, it's like, wow. but it's still like a... a kid game so it's not crazy sure. but um and yeah to speak to that there's you know cool stuff from npcs like little quests or pieces of lore and fun little things to do also just really silly dialogue like my partner's been in the shower forever it's a ground type though it's like that's weird well so why is your pokemon taking a shower by itself what's going on but sometimes you got to clean up um greg caldwell on facebook asks can you have multiple saves if you have multiple accounts on one switch yes yes always for 
all the games. Cool. Yeah. Yep. Um, Travis Herbling on Facebook asks, and this is probably the most important question, um, what is your new favorite Pokemon? We can. And why is it Grookey? I can't talk about my favorite new Pokemon. Oh. Yeah, we bummer. can't yeah. talk about any uh, un unofficially revealed. revealed Pokemon until um, the game comes out. Um, I can tell you about my favorite new Pokemon that was officially revealed. And, and it's Grookey. His name is Grookey. And its name is Ponyta. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. I still really like Lulu. Yeah. Cool. yeah. yeah. I we lose in that game a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Lulu's very amazing. cute. Yeah. There's a lot of Wooloo. But there, I have a different favorite that I'll talk about when we can. And he's my favorite boy, and I love him. Great. Um, Krasrisk on Twitter asks, do you think we could have a rotation between mainline games like Sword and Shield and then another series of Let's Go games? Yeah, I think that's totally feasible. I, um, didn't they there, say they're not coming out with another Let's well, Go? So there was a quote um, around the preview cycle, I think from Game Informer, where they said, we're not currently working on another Let's Go, but you know, if people have a good reception to it, mm -hmm. which they did and it sold extremely yeah. well, we'll uh, look at revisiting it. Um, so I think, I, not necessarily it'll come next year, but I feel like a, another Let's Go yeah, is obvious. Yeah, they're very tight-lipped about that. Like I asked a similar question and they were like, we don't like to have people guessing what we're going to do next. And I was like, all right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I, I think it could be what they do next. Um, one of the m most interesting things I got from my time talking to them during that preview cycle was that they like to mix between like traditional and non-traditional, which is why Sun and Moon had the like gym trials instead of like more traditional gym battles. So that kind of makes me think whatever they do next might be something like, not necessarily not mainline, but that has a, a a distinctive twist. twist in terms of how you get badges. I want, I, I think I want Game Freak to have a longer development cycle. Like mm. we're going to game for Completely. like five years because uh, as great as Sword and Shield is, it's not the Breath of the Wild of Pokemon that people have been wanting. And I think that those high expectations is one of the reasons why people are so upset. By the way, high expectations are the silent killer of relationships. So you know, take so that. lower your standards, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Well, but also, like, have regular standards. You know, like the game should work properly. This is kind of fun. like a, a at the risk of opening kind of a can of worms here. I I oh wonder boy. if people really do want a Breath of the Wild style Pokemon game because like Pokemon games have traditionally been pretty linear, and I think I don't I kind of feel like that is what makes a Pokemon game a Pokemon game, and maybe they just want something that's like totally different and completely breaks the mold, but. Whenever people mention that, I'm like, do, do do you like? I don't think that's something I would want personally because I think that would be extremely overwhelming and would kind of alienate the player base. Like, I think some people would be excited for that, but in order to make it like populated enough and have like it, they're just such different games. I don't I don't think Pokemon would really benefit from that. And I I think there are still improvements to be made on Sword and Shield, but I don't I don't think necessarily I think there's a limit to how open a Pokemon game should be and mm -hmm. still be still feel distinctively Pokemon. I know uh, one of the bigger complaints, not bigger, but one of the complaints that I find the most valid for Pokemon Sword and Shield is that you can run into Pokemon you can't catch if you don't have uh, a badge mm. because you can run into such powerful Pokemon in the wild area. And I don't know if those are shiny locked or not. So there is a situation where you might run into a Pokemon that is shiny and you cannot catch. During my playthrough, I avoided them because, like, I can't catch them, so, like, why bother? So I only ran into five during my entire playthrough before I was able to start catching them all anyway. But yeah. I think that's one of the problems that you could run into with an open-world Pokemon. One of uh, hmm. my biggest criticisms of the, of the game is something that you and I talked about um, off-air, where, like, if you're trying to meet up with people and interact with people in the wild area, which you can do via online or local connection, you can't directly, like trade or battle with them like by walking up to them it's still done through the ycom feature from your menu so it kind of just feels like like something i would like from future pokemon games to build on this formula is to make it feel like a more lived in integrated world with other players that exist like if they could somehow pull that off once again i don't know like what the technical challenges of doing that is but that's what i would like to see where i can feel like i'm a trainer amongst a world of other trainers so not necessarily being open world but just being more easily to like connect with other people mm -hmm. in a way that feels, uh, I think, more authentic. Uh, our friend Odell Harmon Jr. asks over on the Facebook uh, podcast forums, do you feel the Pokemon Go crowd, people whose only Pokemon game has been the mobile one, can make the transition into a core Pokemon game and still have a good time with this depth and strategy? Yeah. 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 Uh, Having not played Sword and Shield. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> yes. I think but I think Pokemon Let's Go would definitely be an easier transition than Pokemon Sword and Shield because the catch mechanics are the same in Let's Go and mm. it's a little bit more simple as far as stats go. But you don't 
I, Pokemon as a whole is geared towards a younger audience, so it's not made to be especially difficult. If you get one favorite Pokemon and all you use is that one, you'll probably level that one up really easy and not have too hard of a game, whereas you try to balance your team and keep them leveled. Like What I'm saying is it's possible to get through this game without knowing a whole lot and mm-hmm. still have a really fun time with it. Yeah, it just depends on if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Pokemon Go to me is very much meant to be a gateway into or back to Pokemon mm-hmm. for people who are either lapsed or just interested in it mm-hmm. but haven't played. Um, similarly, Skyward Sirens on Twitter asks, where do you feel this game sits in terms of accessibility for players that are new to the franchise? Is it a good place to start, or do you think something like Let's Go is a better first option? I think if you've never played a Pokemon game and you already know that you like RPGs or JRPGs, Sword and Shield is a fine, good first Pokemon game and they've already done a lot to get rid of kind of like more older mechanics that seem kind of outdated and updated to be more like modern JRPG so you don't have to kind of deal with the older mechanics that might make you quit halfway through yeah Yeah. Yeah. I I would agree with that especially because the benefit of doing sword and shield it is it's a little bit more traditional and would prepare you better for the next mainline Pokemon game than Let's Go because Let's Go does have like that change in catch mechanics. So it would be easier if you're like, I'm looking to get into the series. If you know Sword and Shield, you're like totally understand what's up with whatever they do next because it's either going to be traditional and similar or like playing on that base idea that you would already be familiar with. I also think Sword and Shield is just a better game. Oh yeah, it's 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 really good. Well, I didn't play that much Let's Go, so I I, I shouldn't say that in that regard, but I, I really love Sword and Shield, and I agree with you, it's my favorite Pokemon game. Especially if you're someone that, like, I know you've played all of them, but, like, ha- being someone that played m- a lot more of the modern ones, like, even, like, Alpha Sapphire mm-hmm. and, and Omega Ruby, like, this it just feels great. I love it. It's awesome. <sighs> sorry. It's a lot I'm of Pokemon. Sorry, Zach. It's a lot of Pokemon. <laughs> oh, we I'm made sorry, it, guys. everybody. This is only, like, a little bit. There's so much you more we could say. Okay. Oh, my God, we made it. We did it. A whole episode. Let's talk about some other Nintendo news now. Can I, can I real quick? Oh, no, I already yes. said we oh, were done. No, I just want You're to, be, not hosting I just this want to be super clear that we can't data mine the game, so we cannot deny or confirm any of those sorts of things. So all we can do is give an educated guess on them. That's it. That's uh, yeah, I'm just totally kidding. Uh, thank you for that addendum. Uh, some other stuff happening this week in the land of Nintendo. Uh, Nintendo president uh, Santaro Furukawa says uh, Nintendo Switch will not be getting a Pokemon. Uh, po- I, it does. It does have a Pokemon. We'll not be getting a price cut anytime <laughs> soon. We want to maintain the value of our products and sell them at their current price point for as long as possible. So we have no plans to reduce price at this time. Um, this is not shocking to me at all. Um, I think with the advent of the Nintendo Switch Lite being a uh, lower price point than the traditional Switch, um, and the Switch getting sort of like a mid-level upgrade in the last year, this doesn't this doesn't surprise me at all that they offer two different price points that they will hold firm on for the rest of the, the Switch's lifetime. Maybe yeah, I don't the, know. What do the, you think? The Switch Lite is their price cut. Like yeah. Nintendo notoriously doesn't lower the price of their game definitely yeah. not. because they value they, they see the value of it as being diminished if they do that and there are ways as a business they can get around that and you as a consumer can like if you want to wait for black friday sales there will be bundles and there will be ways to probably get an extra game for free or for a, a discounted price but the like base price that's just how nintendo tends to operate yeah, I had some people in my mentions over the weekend. I was tweeting about Luigi's Mansion, and they were saying, this looks good, but I'm going to wait for a sale. And I was like, ha-ha. <laughs> good luck Keep with that. Keep waiting. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, this is just like kind of classic Nintendo. You know, they, they know how to run a business. They know how to be profitable year over year, quarter over quarter. So this is uh, uh, not any like surprising news, but news nonetheless. Yeah, I'm, I'd wait for a cool special edition or a bundle that you especially want if you need a deal to feel good about buying it. Yeah, but also Nintendo Switch is a great system, so you can yeah. just buy it if you want. Um, Outer Worlds is confirmed for 2020 release date. Um, no specific date announced yet, but uh, we knew that this game was coming to the Switch when they, we know when uh, uh, 2K and Private Division. Uh, Private Division sorry, yeah. yeah, when Private Division announced that uh, Outer Worlds was coming in October, they also said that it was coming to uh, Xbox, PC, PlayStation, and there, right there at the bottom, was the Nintendo Switch logo. So we knew it was only a matter of time. Um, that game is coming next year. I probably would estimate that this is a quarter one release. Yeah. I think we'll see it before like April of next year. I'm so happy I think, for you guys. I think they'll probably want <laughs> to get it, it again. <laughs> into the fiscal year this year. Um, 
I, I it's curious like Jonathan and I are both playing it. I'm about 20 hours deep. Jonathan, you said you're what, like 10 like hours 10 in? 10 or so, yeah. Uh, it's a phenomenal game. Um, it's very, very good. If you like Fallout, if you like um, Firefly, if you like Mass Effect, I feel like this game will be right up your alley. Have you guys messed with it at all? I haven't played uh, you, it You yet. guys have just been in like just Pokemon very lands. barely because I did a hands-on like, yeah. before oh, it came yeah. out. Okay, yeah. Um, super cool game. I'm uh, glad they're taking the time with the port and they didn't try to rush it out for a like simultaneous launch. Oh yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously that makes a lot of sense to want it on all platforms at the same time, mm -hmm. but this is even though this is a smaller game than I think other, you know, Fallout and Elder Scrolls. Yeah, games supposedly are, you can beat the whole campaign in like 25 hours. It, yeah. If you do that you're a madman because there's yeah. so much to do in that game, but um I do think it's smart of them to make sure it's optimized as well as it can be for Switch. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll have to decide um when it comes out on Switch, assuming that I didn't already get to it by then, if if I want to play it on Switch or if I want to just play it on, on Xbox, because it's on Game Pass, right? Yes, yes it is yeah. on yeah. Game Pass. So, yeah. I don't know. I think it'll be interesting to see um, how it runs, and either way, it'll be cool to have uh, Switch owners get to have their hands on this game, because of what I played of it, I really enjoyed. So, yeah. hoping to get, and get to it. And it. it's an absolutely gorgeous game, I think, art direction-wise especially. I think the character models might leave something to be... Um, Desired. Desired, yeah. They're <laughs> they're kind of they're kind of fugly. They kind of look like PlayStation Three era characters, especially like from Fallout. But um, it's really funny, and the gameplay is like the gunplay is really good, and like I'm just having a hell of a time with it. So I'm I'm excited for and it. And it's to pretty come to easy, even if you're not like super adept at shooters, because it's not like you have your companions there to also do damage. So you don't right. really have to be like super precise with your shots or really knowledgeable in that genre it's pretty easy to well, just like hang out and get through the story the whole conceit is that your character has been uh frozen for some Seven number years, of yeah, yeah some number of years and so he's basically got like mild carbonite poisoning and that that allows him to or her to slow time so like kind of like vats in fallout mm -hmm. you can hit the the right bumper and slow down time and like select limbs and it'll do different damage like if you shoot him in the leg it'll cripple him if you shoot him in the head it'll blind him okay. it, it'll you know it inflicts status so um yeah yeah I like a lot of aspects of that game I love like I played the uh the mission the side mission where you go into the factory and yeah. you decide what you're, yeah with the sisty pigs yeah yeah they're like yeah. adorable and gross and it, I sad. mean that sounds disgusting it is yeah. Yeah. there are world. pigs that are like designed to grow these huge delicious bacon filled like type tumors because you know bacon because they're pigs right and the tumors fall off and then you like use them to make like borst worst yeah mm -hmm. other oh, stuff so it's like meat without having you haven't to... had the worst until right. you've had borst worst oh yeah. gosh the tagline yeah. that they yeah. said so the, yeah it's got a lot of uh, humor and charm i'm looking forward to playing it yeah super cool game uh i would say that if you are not playing that elsewhere um you know look for it when it comes to switch next year uh, okay, probably the most important story this week, and I'm really glad that we made it to at least the opportunity to talk about this. Um, Fire Emblem DLC is coming out soon, and yes, you can finally pet the dog in that game. And the cats. Yes. All those little cats that are running around the school, you can get out there and just get friendly with them. So that's really cool. Obviously, it's not really actually the biggest news story this but week, like, but I, I'm, cute. I'm happy news. to hear it. It's important yeah. news. Um, you know what you can't do in Pokemon? You can't pet the Pokemon, so... No, Damn. You can camp with them and like. Never mind. Like, it's zero out of ten unplayable. I should know, go back and change my review. Yeah, but the. But I, mean, I ate curry with Dreadnought, and that was pretty cool. In in Let's Go, Two you could like give them a nice scritch and like talk to them. Your partner Pokemon, yeah. 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 You can play with Damn. them and you can cook with them. You can't. You cannot. I miss the scritches. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, this is the third of four updates uh, for Fire Emblem, uh, the third DLC pack of four uh, for the expansion, the season pass expansion. Uh, the last one is coming in April, April 30th of 2020. Uh, this one, outside of the ability to pet uh, dogs and cats, um, there's also new quests. There's new uh, attire, a sauna. For a game that is uh, for a game that is already admittedly very horny, yep. this will be a, an interesting addition. Uh, <laughs> What's that going to be like? You like walk up to people in the sauna, like, well, hey. it's like they it's just like it's just another activity. It was so, so crazy to battle you, you alongside. Go, you, you can sauna. I can go sauna with Claude. Yeah, is that what you're uh, yeah, saying? Yeah, and you can like, yeah, you can like adjust the heat, game. and yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> is this still a fire emblem? You game? can adjust the heat. Oh um, and uh, also, it allows you to recruit Anna uh, through a special quest. Okay. Yeah. I actually haven't jumped back into Fire Emblem since a lot of the stuff, new stuff has been dropping, so this might be a good opportunity That's to get back into it. That's a ridiculous amount of content from that game, like, especially mm -hmm. considering the fact that so many people say it has, like, such high replay value based on the, you know, house and mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. So, that's crazy. Yeah, I, I already put, I already put, like, close to 70 hours into it this year. Um, I did only did one playthrough uh, because, like, I feel like 
just given the the breadth of everything that's come out this year, I've not had an opportunity to go back and play mm-hmm. through it again. But um, yeah, I'd like to jump back in and do some of the DLC stuff. Uh, okay, what else? Do we have enough time for... Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, Shovel Knight, King of Cards, and uh, Showdown are coming to Switch on December 10th. Uh, this is the final major content update for Shovel Knight Treasure Tro- Trove. Um, the physical Switch version, the Amiibo 3-pack, and the Golden Shovel Knight Amiibo are also launching on the 10th. And I think the most important question that we can ask about Shovel Knight at this point is, are the developers of Shovel Knight finally free? <laughs> are they able to so. be I mean, released from their cage of Shovel Knight? I think they like their Shovel Knight cage. They, I, it's, a, it's a cage yeah. of their own making. Well, now you sound the, those people that are like spew, like, you know, are against spew in Harry Potter. Exactly. Yeah. Um, they I'm, like they like helping. It's but no, I like mean, like, do. these were all things, I, it's hugely impressive to me because these were all things that were part of the original Kickstarter campaign and they have like followed through and made sure to um, release all of the things that they promised yeah, for insane. all the stretch goals and yeah. more. And like, it, it should be noted that Showdown is not coming to the 3DS version yeah. of the game. Um, yeah. And Showdown, I actually got to play that a while back when they revealed it, and it's a super fun, like, uh, crazy, f- up-to-four-player, multiplayer uh, rumble sort of thing. Uh, oh, a nice rumble. It's a, it's a good rumble. Uh, but that between that and King of Cards, like those are things they could have probably released as their own games, but they were committed to... The original Shovel Knight platform. Yeah. I think that's awesome. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Um, I'm hoping that sh- that Yacht Club is winding down on Shovel Knight, and I'm hoping that they move to make the 16-bit RPG that I know that I want to see from them. <laughs> Shovel Knight um, too. Yeah. yeah. Or or Shovel Knight 64. I think that would okay. be really yeah. cool too if they just made like an N64 style platformer. Um, that's it for news this week. Let's real quick go down the list of uh, what we're playing. Casey and Janet. Y'all have just been playing Pokemon. Yeah, just, just Pokemon. Yeah, just, just all Pokemon it's all the time. It's gonna keep being Pokemon for another maybe two weeks mm-hmm. while we work on the wiki, right? And wiki videos, yeah, which I think like the features. the degree to which I like this game is is definitely a testament to the game in the sense that I have to play so much of it and spend so much time with it. It's mm-hmm. really easy to get sick of even a, a good or great game when you're doing a wiki on it. But um, I booted it up like before the show started, and I'm like, damn, this game's really good. Mm-hmm. So yeah, hopefully it'll still be fun in the next. 50 hours. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm still uh, making my way through Luigi's Mansion. Yeah. Uh, that game is uh, just proves to be more and more charming the deeper in I get and more and more fun. Um, I will say I ran into the first level of the game that are the first like puzzle mm. that I wasn't wild about and it kind of turned me off. Um, and that is the level, the TV production level. Really? Oh, yeah. I, that was the first puzzle that I was like, ooh, they're like really trying something. Because that's like, that puzzle's that. like yeah. a little obtuse at first. Like once you figure it out, it it's very simple. Like once you realize like, oh, this is what you have to do. It's like one, two, three, four, and then you're done. Yeah. But just like that initial, like I was bouncing back and forth between the rooms and like trying to figure it out. And then it was like, it introduces, I think that that level in particular introduces a, a, a puzzle mechanic in an inelegant way. Like it doesn't necessarily like highlight the fact that you have the you have to use something to solve it, mm-hmm. and then when you have to, like you kind of just have to stumble upon it to figure it out. It's like yeah, oh okay, I, this is what I have to do here. Admittedly, yeah. I don't think I could make a super good argument for it being well designed in a way that slowly kind of feeds the player that information and yeah. in subtle and interesting ways, or lends itself to the traditional exploration of Luigi's Mansion games, where usually it's like you vacuum and pull on stuff yeah, and like you slowly piece it together. That one is really different, but that's kind of what I liked about it. Sure. Like I liked that that was the first time I got a little bit stuck in the game and that, that felt refreshing yeah, in the sense that that's what it was to be usually like, not that hard. So that's, that's the yeah. first time that I was like, I don't know what to do here. Like, did, damn it. How'd you figure it out? Did you have to use the EGAD hotline or did uh, you just kind of, no, I just was like, I mean like the, it's the same way you figure out everything in that game. You just like vacuum everything or flashlight everything until something different happens. And you're like, Oh, Okay, now I see. The boss on that level was really fun. Some uh, of the yes. bosses are very creative. The bosses are freaking cool. Uh, but I thought of you mm-hmm. because I know you're playing through at co-op. co-op yeah. Yeah. And before that, ba- are you there? Have we you haven't gotten, gotten to the- there yet. Okay. No, we took a little so bit before, of So before that, uh, in that same level, which is like the or bef- the level before the garden level, mm-hmm. which I think is my favorite level so far. Garden Suites? Yeah, it's really yeah. good. Um, there's like giant watermelons that block your path. Oh, yeah. And at one point, like I'm pulling on this watermelon as Luigi, like trying to get the watermelon to like flip. And I was like, this is stupid. Like, why won't it do like, why won't it just like flip over? I was like, I, man, it it seems like I need like double suction power or something. And then it was like, 
right. <laughs> I have a both. whole second character yeah. that I'm not using. Yeah, you're yeah. right around the section where I feel like the game does have like some ramp up, which I really appreciated. Like the yeah. grand squeeze definitely like it took me a second to figure out how to move that watermelon. Yeah. I was like, how do you move this watermelon? Yeah, I mean, I it's think that so that's heavy. I think that's what, that's what's brilliant about Luigi is like it is for all intents and purposes a puzzle game and it just gets progressively more puzzly and I like I'm really really loving it I think it's kind of moved up my hierarchy as like a game that I was like excited to play and f like having fun to like genuinely considering it in like top five game of the year territory I'm really yes. excited to finally be able to play it sometime <laughs> in the somewhat it's so near good future. I'm glad yeah. you're enjoying it yeah, yeah a lot of people seem like it I've seen nothing but positive reception of it and I don't know if that's because most people that play it would already kind of like Luigi's Mansion games, and it's kind of well, almost a self-fulfilling thing. But uh, it's been nothing but but good from what I've seen. We talked about it a little bit last week, but like I think the reason that I like it so much is that it, it really combines what I liked about the first game and what I liked about the second game in a way that makes sense. Like it's, yeah, I have the same it's, critique. Yeah, it's like the way that the, it paths in on itself and has like a bigger, like m more organic feel to the, the levels themselves, and then the like puzzle-solving nature. Uh, of each of those levels working in conjunction to form like one experience is like really mm -hmm. really cool and you're you're like pretty deep in it too right yeah yeah well, i'm not up to where you are but yeah we've been playing in co-op and still having a blast with it it's i'm glad so many people are being converted to the church of luigi because <laughs> yeah is it's wonderful. about time yeah uh, and now we'll get them all into the church of gooigi but uh yeah i've been playing that a bunch in co-op still need to make some more progress and i've still been doing switch wise not every day, but probably like every other day, still Ring Fit Adventure, trying to oh, keep yeah, up with it. Oh yeah, I'm playing that still yeah, too. Yeah, you're looking yeah. pretty ripped these days, oh, I noticed. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, it hides under this jacket. But um, yeah, I've still been playing that every other day or so, and it's it's still been pretty fun. It's still like the issues I had at the start of it are still pretty much the same, um, but as a like workout tool device yeah. to get me into the habit of it, I think it's really good in that capacity. Yeah, I've, I've also been doing it, and there's no way I would have been going to the gym this past week or <laughs> yeah. like working out if I didn't have this I just thing. unlocked the uh, the plank move. Oh, yeah. I did and too. I'm like, oh, man, this is really hard because <laughs> planks are hard. I, there's there's this one move in there that I, so I did the, I did all of the yoga moves just because like I need a stretch, but there's, I think it's called the boat, and I, oh, like boat pose? <laughs> yeah, I, I like, can't do it. Oh, is that where it's like, wait, the bow, you mean? No, the boat. Oh, no. Is, like, is you're that on... where one leg goes backward and then. No, your so you have, you, you get, I can't even describe you it. You put one it's leg really all hard. the way <laughs> over your head. <laughs> it's one of the things where you, all the way on your back and it's like a harder, imagine a harder <laughs> version of a sit up. Is it yeah, it's that, like that, right? That yeah. One. Oh, yeah. So I, it's the I can't do that. It's really? basically, it make, your, it's, it's basically make your body do this, a like v. make a V. Yeah. yeah. It looks very difficult. Probably like shreds your abs, though. Yeah. I think my core strength is not good enough, and my hips are not, are just. Messed they're up just from, there. They're I mean, just messed uh, up from sitting all day, man. Like I just like I better. know we've surprisingly talked about Ring Fit a lot on this show, but one thing that I was really blown away by, like still the technology of the Joy-Con, like for Ring Fit is it crazy. Works so well. Like for the plank move, it's basically like you're in a plank, but you also like move your body back and then move forward, kind of like a rocking plank, or I don't know what the better phrase for that workout is. And I'm like, how am I supposed to do this without looking at the screen? Which is a big challenge of if you, if you guys do workout videos, you know that sometimes you're like what is the person doing? And you have to look up. But because the Joy-Con is on your leg, it vibrates to tell you when to move back. Ah, and like cool. that kind of haptic feedback makes doing that exercise so easy and makes it so that you don't have to crane your neck or look up at all. And it's stuff like that that's just so smart and so cool. Yeah. Um, we have to wrap up the show. I'm uh, 15 minutes late for my meeting with my oh new no. boss. Oh so no. I got to go. Cool. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you so much for talking about Pokemon for so long. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> we uh, we will probably talk about Pokemon more this year. It is a huge, huge release for Nintendo. It's a big deal for us too. So, um, thank you guys so much uh, for joining thank you, me. Zach. Uh, thank you to Logan, uh, the NVC assistant, for helping out this week as he does uh, every week. Don't forget that NVC is IGN's Nintendo show every Thursday at 3 p.m. on IGN.com and YouTube.com slash Nintendo Voice Chat. Come back next week where Casey will probably be hosting. I will. I'll be back next week. <laughs> and she will help you. Get the, Get the thing. thing.